because my mind and my brain are separate but work together, and because my brain can change, if I change my mind, there's tremendous hope. So today I'm talking to the very eminent Dr. Caroline Leaf. And Dr. Caroline is a communication pathologist and a cognitive neuroscientist, which is very impressive. And you've studied how the brain can change with direct mind input, which I'm very excited to ask you all about. I'd love to ask you what got you started. I know you're the best-selling author of a number of books, including Switch on Your Brain, Think, Learn, Succeed, Think and Eat Yourself Smart, and your latest book, which is my favorite, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. So I'd love to ask you, what got you started on this, on studying the mind and, of course, how we can change it? Well, thank you, Melissa, for having me on your show. And you're asking one of my favorite questions because, well, all of these, I love talking about the mind and the brain. Um, I started off in the field of um, in neuroscience but in the in the 80s when it was not even really a full-on understanding of the brain you know we we had we obviously understood the brain but they didn't believe the brain could change and the mind and the brain were seen as separate and we were having a lecture by one of our neuroscientist professors the one day and he said the brain can't change so therefore when you work with traumatic brain injured patients or you work with your different patients you have to teach them how to compensate and that immediately challenged me to think okay something's not right here because as humans we constantly constantly changing, be growing. And our, our brain is the organ that we use to do that. So therefore, the brain must be changing. So I challenged, I said to him, can I do research in the area? And they actually said to me, a whole group of professors, except two, said to me, that is a ridiculous question. But the two that didn't say, they said, listen, we'll support you. Go ahead, do the research. And I said, okay, well, give me the worst or well, the most challenging population. And that was traumatic brain injury at the time. In the 80s, there was, you may recall, there was just literally no research on people with brain injuries. They weren't doing much research because they thought, well, the brain's damaged. What can you really do? Just teach them techniques. So I started doing work in that area. And in the this was the late 80s, early 90s. And I showed, did some of the first neuroplasticity research in my field, showing that we're with directed mind input. In other words, when you directly and intentionally understand what it means to manage your mind and to control thought building, and build the memories inside the thoughts in a very directed and organized and systematized way, you can literally rebuild the brain. And then that'll translate into improvement in your cognitive, social, emotional, intellectual, and overall functioning. And I showed that. I showed a 35 to 75% improvement. And from there, I just started launching out into looking at all the different populations that I possibly could. So from traumatic brain injury, I worked with autism, I worked with people with learning, severe learning disabilities, dementias, um, severe trauma. I was in Africa at the time working in, in the apartheid era, the terrible apartheid era. I worked through the transition with Mandela coming to power, the post-apartheid South Africa. I was three days a week, I was working in, in areas that were very socially, um, d- absolutely on every level they were messed up and um, people were really battling on absolutely every level. And it was there that I learned so much a, a parallel to running a practice, um, I ran a practice for 25 years, I learned so much doing the clinical research and the clinical practice about understanding what the mind is in real life and how what resilience is and what it means to really have agency over your mind and what you can do about that. And then I basically fast forward that 38 years later, I've been doing brain research, constantly writing books just to try and help people understand how to manage their mind and how to manage their mental health. And basically, that's where, we, where I'm sitting still today. <laughs> I'd love you to give our audience some tips on how to manage their mental health, because I hear people saying, just as you must, you can't change and it's impossible to change. It's too hard to change. That's the way I am. Or, well, this depression is genetic or the alcoholism runs in my family. So could you give us some tips on how we can manage our mind, change our mind, clean up our mental mess. Uh, that's it's also that's such an important question and you're so right on on the front on the comment you make about the fact that people say it's in my family it's genetic it's depression it's genetic that is because the messaging has been so incorrect for the past 40 years and I'm sure you're familiar with this in your in your career I've watched this trajectory of how we've gone from recognizing the whole person and looking at the whole person in the environment and recognizing the impact of environment on the person to looking at just the brain and as so as we've advanced in neuroscience which is 
has been essential and it's been amazing and it's been part of what I've been doing my research in. We've advanced with the brain, but we've advanced in, in almost uh, to the exclusion of advancing in understanding mind. So mind and brain have become subsumed into one thing. So when people talk about brain, they talk about mind. So when people talk about depression, they think it's a disease of the brain because that's the messaging. But that's not actually accurate science at all. That is inaccurate science. It's not actually the truth. What we need to understand, or that's not actually the facts, what we need to understand is that, and this is a this is a really good first tip, is to understand that the mind and the brain are separate but inseparable, that your mind is not your brain. And with that comes the hopeful message of I have a level of agency. I'm not controlled by my brain. I actually control my brain. Now, that doesn't mean that if my brain is damaged from a tumor or a traumatic brain injury or medications or whatever, that there is some influence back in my mind because it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loop. It's a feedback system that's happening. But the easiest way to understand this um, in, in this sort of first tip of mind-brain difference is to recognize that um, the difference between and a person who's alive and a person who's dead is the mind. The mind is the thing that's doing the stuff. Our mind is enabling you and I to have this conversation. It's enabling people to experience the, the pandemic, to experience a great relationship, to experience a sunset, to eat, to walk, to go and work out. It's your mind that is helping you experience that. So your mind is this phenomenal first cause power that enables us to experience life. And mind can we can look at mind on a very um, psychological level and we see and we can define it very simplistically as being how we think, feel and choose thinking, feeling, and choosing, working together as a triad. And then we can look at it on a very physics level where we see that it's it's involved in its gravitational fields and electromagnetic forces and so on. And when we do use technology, like I use in my neuroscientific research, we use QEEG technology. If it's a dead person, we won't see a response. But if it's an alive person, that person's thinking, feeling, and choosing, their mind's doing stuff, they're experiencing life, we're going to see a response inside the brain. So when you look at it like that, that my mind is driving my brain, and this is the research I did back in the 80s that I was referring to, the mind can change the brain. And if the mind is messy, it's still changing the brain, and this is the plastic paradox, but it's changing it in a bad way and or in a sort of way that becomes damaging. So we see from the neurobiology that our mind is and our mind, brain, and body, which is psycho neurobiology, is wired in a direction of optimism, the optimism bias, or wired for love, as some scientists say. And that means that we don't have structures for, we don't have depression in your brain waiting to jump out. You don't have that's not that we don't have this damage there waiting. What we have is life adverse experiences. We process it through our mind. We use our brain. Our mind then shows up inside the brain. And it shows up inside the brain as a the neuroplastic change. So the experience is built into the brain. And if it's a healthy experience, we're going to build it in as a healthy thought. And this is the second tip. When it's a healthy experience, we actually build that in as a, as a physical thought. So I've got a little tree that I'm going to hold up. And this is literally what thoughts look like. They look like trees in the brain. We talk about thoughts as having an arbor-like structure in neuroscience. And like a tree has got roots and branches, and that's a tree, this is what thoughts are. Thoughts are these trees with lots of memories. All the branches and roots are memories. So thoughts are made of memories. And we are literally building life with our mind into our brain as these thought trees with all these memories. And these memories are all the emotions, which are like the glue and all the data, everything that's happened. And this is what we use to show up in life. So it's experience, mind, into brain, build that, and then that's how we then show up in life. Also, our body is implicated in the process genetically. So this also impacts our gene in every single cell of our body. So I'm saying all that to say that there's a tremendous amount of hope in the recognition that, okay, so if something's happened to me, because my mind and my brain are separate but work together, and because my brain can change, if I change my mind, there's tremendous hope. So I can't change what's happened to me, the abuse, the trauma, the whatever, um, but I can change what's in me. I can change the toxic and this is a wiry tree. So if we have a toxic experience, I use this tree to show that the proteins fold incorrectly and all the chemical balance is off, et cetera. But that doesn't have to be how you live into your future. That is basically can be changed. You can change what's in you. You can deconstruct this and reconstruct it. It's not just simply replace it like a CBT technique. It's actually a complete deconstruction and reconstruction, which then changes how 
plays out into the future. So I know that's a long answer, but it's very foundational to people understanding how to help themselves. It, you know, to just give someone, okay, do these five things or do these three things or do breathing or meditation, all of those only help to a certain extent because they prepare the brain, but you have to do more. You have to do the deconstruction, reconstruction, but you won't do that unless you understand the power that you have in your mind and the agency that that brings and the empowerment that that brings. Yeah, we have to understand that thoughts are things. Every thought you think has a physical reaction and indeed an emotional response. So I love the way you've separated the mind and the brain because most people say, what's the difference? There's a brain and a mind, aren't they the same? And what's the difference? And the difference is huge, but how could, what advice could you give our audience? How could they use their mind to heal, to grow, to succeed in every area of their life? What kind of tips could you give us? Very simple, practical things that would help people use their mind to heal and grow their brain to succeed. Okay, so first part is that the, you said what you've said really, really well in your question is what can they do to grow their brain? And that's absolutely key. You, you can grow your brain. So one of the most important mental health secrets that people don't really discuss is this concept of growing your brain. So your brain is a very, very hungry organ. It wants to be constantly stimulated. When it's dead, it doesn't need that because it's it's disintegrating. So your mind once again becomes the source of the brain's desire to, or the, or the brain's need to be built. So an, an alive person is now creating this, this, uh, this, this force in the brain and the brain wants to grow. So when we talk about growing the brain, I talk about building the brain. We want to, uh, the brain constantly wants to have new knowledge. So when you wake up in the morning, you have lots and lots of new baby nerve cells, that's neurogenesis. And those new baby nerve cells are need, need to be used during the course of the day they're basically there for the to be built into the networks of the brain to have other branches grown from them because as we're thinking feeling and choosing we actually have this ability to grow new thoughts to make new proteins to, as i've been saying you can you take the, the the knowledge and you convert it into these structures which are made of protein so brain building is an essential tip and brain building is quite simplistically taking spending at least 45 minutes to two hours in in blocks you can spend a 15 minute block Block, whatever, but to try and build into the course of your day at least a 15 minute. But if you can ideally go for a two hour sort of over either in one stop, one stop or broken up over the day, but brain building. So brain building is as is taking anything. It could be taking taking a newspaper article, it could take a video that you love watching or something on YouTube that, that fascinates you. It could be a fiction, non-fiction book, it could be anything. And the concept is to take that knowledge and to systematically go through that and grow that as thoughts into your brain. As you do that, you draw on those new baby nerve cells and you create these lattices in your brain that then help you to, uh, to get the brain into a very resilient state. So as the stresses of the day and as the undealt with traumas of the past and as the new traumas of the current and future, which is going to happen, come, your latticing is very strong in your brain. So it's kind of found a foundational thing. So with my patients, when I practice, the first thing I would always do is obviously once we've done the basic diagnostics and so on, would be to build part of the session would always be brain building. And then I would go into the, the heavy stuff of the detoxing and the sort of fixing part so that you build strength in before that. So that's one that's one tip. And then there's obviously a system that I've got for over, overarching all of these. But then another basic tip is when you wake up in the morning, what's absolutely vital is as you when you go to sleep at night, your the way that the, the your chemicals move through your brain and the way that the different parts of your brain function shift. So your mind almost makes your brain work back to front at night and then in, during the day it's front to back sort of thing so things shift now as you're waking up in the morning this shift from wakefulness sleep to wakefulness is a very very critical time where we start the process that we need to continue through the day as a tip and that is self-regulation to be very to i call it the self it's self-regulation but there's a specific way you do it where, where you employ this ability that we have as humans to stand back and observe yourself so as you stand back and observe yourself we can do it right now as i'm talking you can watch yourself listening you can watch yourself i mean i can watch myself i know my hands are moving i'm aware of me watching you i'm aware of 
everything in my office. I'm aware of my voice to intonation simply because I said it. So in other words, I am consciously and deliberately watching how I am thinking, feeling, choosing and expressing myself and the impact on others. Now, that is that skill will help us to manage the messiness of our mind in the morning as you wake up and then set the tone for managing during the day. So self-regulation starts as you wake up and you, and you catch yourself, for example, complaining or very negative. That causes brain damage literally immediately and throws your brain waves off and your frequencies of your brain, etc. And that sets you up for a bad day unless you catch it or just makes the day so much more tough. So if you can immediately get into and observe that and then shift and say, okay, why am I feeling like this? Well, how can I reconstruct that? Just, I mean, that can take you a few seconds and there's a whole system that I've developed called the neurocycle that you can use to develop these all these neurocycle things and then during the course of the day if you can once you start the day like that keep in a self-regulated state keep in this multiple perspective advantage and and keep doing your brain building I mean that's just a couple of tips and then there's obviously the whole system that I've developed to do this called the neurocycle which is based on you know, the theory that you mentioned, my geodesic theory, plus all my research for the over the past 30 years, 38 years and the clinical application. So those are a couple of tips. There's a million different things, but those are a couple of good starts. Could you tell us a story maybe about someone who came in who didn't believe this would work, who you really turned around with your process? Because I think we can all, all relate to stories of particular clients so well. Oh, absolutely. Well, there's there's so many, but I think what was really, I can tell you two different stories. One of a, someone with traumatic brain injury, which was really severe, and then someone with maybe someone who was really battling with depression, didn't think they could get through something. So basically, uh, one of my first subjects that I used in one of my research studies was a traumatically brain injured young girl who was 16 at the time of her accident. And um, she was a very average student and really you know, didn't do that well at school, but was really part and part, you know, really party animal, loved to loved her friends and was having, you know, very popular. And she had a terrible car accident with her brother and she was in a coma for two weeks. And the significance of that is that in the 80s, when you were, what we knew about the brain at that stage, if you had a, in, a, in a coma for longer than eight hours, the brain damage was considered irreversible. So already within eight hours, the parents were being told that this child will never wake up if she does she's going to be a vegetable now thank goodness they don't talk like that anymore but that is the messaging that the parents had they just did not listen they just refused to hear that and they just continued to stimulate and believe that their daughter would come through so they spoke over her and they had their friends there and while she was in a coma they just really continued to stimulate now we know 38 years later that it is so important to do that when people are in a coma they can hear and they can come around and all that stuff but at that stage they didn't know but these parents had the instinct to do it so fast forward um this child did, uh, did come out of her coma and got back home started walking and very badly but sort of walking talking and was trying to function was determined to get back to um, school to finish schooling her peer group were, were going into the end of their, night, their second last year at school and the parents contacted me about within about a year after the accident now what I need to stress is that within a year of a traumatic brain injury if you don't treat within that first year and they had done as what they could but basically the theory then was that well you can't do much more and so it, you know, it was just lucky kind of thing and so we got I got her at what they call the plateau state so in other words she shouldn't have improved anymore that's it but listen to what happened with um, they came to me it was early on in my research and I said okay well I'm developing these systems that's why they approached me and, they, and I said if you want to try we can I can't guarantee it's very early days and they immersed themselves in the program three sort of eight hours a week um, three hours with me and then on their own long fast forward again this within eight months this this went and she came to me this young girl was only kind of managing on a second grade level intellectually within eight months she had caught up with her peer group finished school and went on to finish school with flying colors so whereas before she was very average and couldn't even she was really battling with things like math she became a math genius she went on to get a degree she went on to make a massive difference in her life when we went back to the neurologist that initially said she was going to be a vegetable their comments to us to the parents and myself were that oh you were lucky now that is not luck anyway that that started another whole yeah. chain of research and um, what was key with her was her willingness 
to work hard. It was hard work. There were many tears, many days she wanted to give up, but it was that persistence and that and it's time, it's hard. But she did brain building every day. She used the neurocycle system, which I've developed, um, and it's been advanced since then. She used the first form, which was like 38 years ago, and that worked so well. Since then, I've obviously developed the system. But it was just, it was that, you, you know, you we need each other, but I can't do it. I couldn't do it for her. I could only be there to support and give the system and guide her. She had to make that choice to actually dive in and push and put in the hard work and, and push through the hard times. And as you and I both know, being in therapy for so many years, things get worse before they get better. So I always want to tell people with a story that things did get worse before they got better, way worse, but then they got better because the way worse is actually, as you start improving, you start seeing how you were. So you're not really worse, you're actually progressing, but it feels worse because you're now so much more aware of, gosh, I can't do that, but now I'm gonna do this. And it's and it's to push through those hard times. That's when we see the major changes inside people's lives. So that's one thread. I don't know if you want another one yes, related to. Another one. Yeah, because stories, we all relate to stories. because We do, we do. All about us. So yes, I'd love another one. Well, there's a, I actually put that case study in my latest book, you may, may have read it, it was one of the subjects of my current clinical trial. Um, and this particular subject, and I, I will obviously keep the, the name and, and so on anonymous. But this particular subject, all my subjects in the clinical trial, we did what we call a randomized controlled trial, double blinded, which meant that I didn't know, nor did the subjects, nor did any of my, my um, analysis team, um, my, my neuroscientists that work with me, neurologists and neuroscientists and neurosurgeons, none of us knew who was doing the treatment and who wasn't okay so what this study was was we were using the system that i've developed that that particular subject that i told you about who had the traumatic brain injury that young girl that system of it's a five-step system that i've now advanced and developed over the years and it's called the neurocycle and i explain it in here it's not a technique it is simply how you kind of gather your thoughts and get the the wise mind working with the messy mind to direct the neuroplasticity of your brain so it's a system and within that system you can put whatever techniques you want whatever uh, meditation, breathing, CBT, ACT, there's a million techniques out there. But if you put it into the system, you're then driving the mind and the brain in the right direction and you'll get the changes that are sustainable and needed. Okay, so that's what we would, uh, we, that I have been testing. But in this particular clinical trial, we were taking it to a whole different level. So fast forward to the story, this particular subject came in and the, we looked at blood mark, but there are standardized blood markers that we know that if someone is in a very toxically stressed state or very in a very depressed state, um, that we will see certain biomarkers like inflammation in the brain and the body. And there's certain blood markers that we can look at. So we looked at all the standard ones like cortisol and DHEA and the cortisol DHEA ratio and homocysteine and ACTH. So there's various blood markers. We also looked in there at their brain. We're using the QEEG, which is a fantastic way of looking at the response of the brain because your brain is just a responder in real time and how it changes and it's really great because it looks at the energetic waves across the, the frequencies across the brain in terms of how we're managing our minds because it's, it's okay to make a mess that's big that's another really important tip it's okay to make a mess it's okay to be depressed it's okay to be anxious they're messengers the thing is is not to stay there the thing is to manage it okay so what we were teaching in the study was how to identify the mess be okay with making the mess but let's also now manage the mess and in order to manage a mess and to reconceptualize, find out why you're depressed, for example, why your life's in this overwhelm, and in order to find out the root cause and then to reconstruct that, that takes time. It's going to take about, a, it's sort of dedicated amounts of time each day over a period of time. So I also wanted to look at that time factor, which I've been studying for years too. And so basically what I'd researched and showed was that you've got to work in cycles of 63 days. So it's not 21 days to form a habit like people have been saying, that's just a myth. It takes around about three weeks or 21 days to find, to, to, to become aware of your patterns and then to deconstruct them and reconstruct them. So it takes cycles of 63 days for change to happen. And this is so significant because so many people get to the point of knowing that, okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. They, I was abused as a child or had a terrible marriage or the pandemic, they've lost a loved one or the isolation. So people are fairly good at having a big picture view of why there's certain patterns in their life once they sit down and start working on it. But what people don't always know what to do is how to reconstruct them into acceptable versions and then how long it takes. So people give up too soon um, because of this lack of knowledge. And even in therapy settings, uh, people tend to go around 
round and round because they don't progress through the sort of cycle. So what I've seen from the brain research that I've done is that you you need around about 15 to 45 minutes a day using the neurocycle, which is a five-step process for, for the first around about three weeks. That'll help you become aware of the pattern, start from the signals right down to the root cause and then to deconstruct that and reconstruct that into something that is your story happened you can't change the fact that whatever happened to you happened but you can change how it's playing out in your life and so and i'm going to bring the lady the the story back to i'm going to bring the story back into the moment i'm just laying the foundation of what, what this person did um and then for the next 42 days or another two cycles of 21 days you need to stabilize and grow that and give that that new way of thinking a lot of strength and as you're doing it so it takes another 42 days to change that that new thought pattern from the toxic which has become now healthy into something that's actually usable that will impact your thinking your feeling and choosing so that it impacts your social emotional cognitive behaviors and, and those your life changes so you don't just sit there going oh my gosh i know i should be doing that but i just can't get there you know it's like the bridge from here to there's this huge chasm so that 42 days builds that bridge between knowing what you should be doing to actually doing it or living your life according to that so the the, the neuro cycle is the system that you do daily for these 63 day cycles now it doesn't mean you're going to heal a trauma one one massive trauma in 63 days there's, there's no cookie cutter thing this is just the science of the time frame but you might need multiple cycles i mean i had one subject i mean one patient in my practice a few years back when I still practice, I don't practice anymore, who had such severe trauma that it took almost two years. So it took 34, 63 day cycles before they felt like they had a handle on all the areas of the trauma and the impact that it had, where they feel that they could actually move forward. And each step was a progress. So I want to say that, that there's a time frame involved. There's a fixed time that you use during the day. And there is multiple cycles, potentially depending on the level of trauma. The other thing is, is, is it's so important to be kind to yourself when you do this, mm -hmm. because at our core, we are wired for love. We see that in our biology. We are actually amazing. We're phenomenal. So if we're showing up with all these patterns of depression, et cetera, in our life, that's not who we are, it's who we've become. And so the neurocycle and the system I'm talking about is helping you be kind to yourself, accepting that that's you've become like that because of and that there's a way of, of managing that and getting through can't change what's happened but you can change what's in you and how it plays out into your future so now come back to, coming back to the story this particular subject when we looked at her blood work and her brain and all the psychological testing and then we looked at the most important thing of all which was her narrative the who is she who are you who is he what is the person what is going on in your life what's been going on in your life and that was very revealing and obviously i'm not going to share all the details but this person's initial narrative was very interesting at day one this this person's narrative was i am depression they've been diagnosed and labeled with clinical depression and um, all the all the labels you can get psychiatrically this poor person had so they had that had become their identity they had tried every therapy that you could think of every medication they were done they were literally checking out someone convinced them to come on the study but they thought well this is it they they were young they were basically in their early 30s but they were battling with everything they're literally not sleeping relationships broken acting like crazy at work, getting to the, having periods in their life where they just couldn't get out of bed for weeks at a time. They were just so frustrated. And um, so, and, and that's what, the, that is the sort of background to the story. We then put them after all the testing, we loaded the neurocycle into their phone because I've made it into a technology. It's in the book, but we've also got, I've also got an app called the neurocycle app, which you can find at iTunes and Google play. And that's what we put into her phone. And so into this person's phone and we didn't, so I didn't give them therapy. And that's what I want to stress. Therapy is so important. I am so pro therapy as you are obviously coaching, therapy, counseling, we need it. We need that support. But you're not with your therapist 24-7. You're with yourself 24-7. So what I teach is mind management 24-7. So when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're freaking out and you've got a panic attack, what can you do? When you're at work and you're in a meeting and you feel yourself falling apart, what can you do? In other words, between sessions, how do you manage yourself? And that's where this neurocycling process is very effective. It's also very effective to use in therapy. We have a lot of therapists that are and coaches that use this actually in therapy. Okay, so this person then went back for 21 days and they did it for 15 to 45 minutes. Why so specific? Your brain is a physical organ. Like your body, your brain gets really tired. 
but your mind never gets tired. Your mind never stops. It works 24 seven. Your mind drives everything, your conscious mind, your subconscious, your non-conscious, three levels of mind. Conscious minds only awake when you're awake, but your non-conscious and subconscious are working 24 seven and they don't get tired. And that's why sometimes you shake your head and think, oh, my brain's tired. Your brain does get tired. And when our brain gets tired, it runs out of energy, much like when we off a cell phone goes flat and got too many apps open and we haven't charged it enough or whatever. Um, that's so we've when, when you do emotional work like this, it's very important to limit it. So I always say stick with 15 to 45 minutes when you're doing hard work, toxic trauma work, and give and then close off for the day and then pick it up the next day. So this is what this uh, this um, particular subject did. After 21 days, they came back into the clinic. And on day one, their brain scans showed that they, they had what we call a blue brain, which meant that their energy waves of their delta, alpha, alpha th uh, sorry, theta, delta, alpha, beta, gamma, and high gamma waves, which are how your brain work together mm -hmm. to help you be alive and then work with your oxygen and blood flow. They, they're supposed to be like the waves in the sea, but they were, it wasn't, it was like flat line. And when it's flat line, that's dangerous. Dangerous to low oxygen, blood, energy, that is really bad. It means your heart, you know, your blood pressure, everything. This person's had inflammation in their brain, their body, even their telomeres. I did telomere research too. Telomere is the end of a chromosome. So if I hold up my finger and you look at my, imagine my finger is a chromosome, which looks like an X, my fingernails would be a telomere. And telomeres tell us about about our biological health, what is um, how our health is, and they're driven by our mind. And so this person at the beginning of the study, their telomeres and all of their inflammation markers, I mean, their heart neurologically, how they, they basically, what all of this told us, the story was this person story, besides saying that their life's a mess and that they are depression, their biological age was, at a, was 35 years older than their actual age. So they were in their 30s, but their body was a body of a sickly 65 year old. So they that combination didn't bode well. Within 21 days, that had completely, literally completely changed. Within 21 days, the narrative of this person had shifted from I am depression to I'm not depression. Depression is not an identity. It's not an it. It is a signal telling me I'm going through something. And I'm actually more depressed and more anxious. And I see the treatment effect. Things get worse before they get better. Because they said, because now I know why, uh, what had happened. They had suppressed terrible, 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 terrible childhood trauma. And they hadn't, hadn't faced it. And during this process, the trauma had, the reason for the depression had started coming up. In other words, the root. And that made them so sad. I mean, it's normal. If you see what happened to you and you've, you know, you've kind of, you go back to the inner child and you see all that, it's very, 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 makes you very sad. And that's normal. It's progress. It's, so she said it's a, um, this person said it's a different kind of depression, a different kind of anxiety. It's an awareness one. So that's progress. And that person's biomarkers were improving, the telomeres. By, then they went off for another 42 days and they carried on. But the second 42 days, you don't spend 15 to 45 minutes. You just spend around about five to 10 minutes. By the 63rd, uh, 63rd day when they came back into clinic and we did everything again, the brain scans, the blood work, the narrative, the psychological testing, and we did testing in between as well. This person was saying, okay, I've got I've got this. I can see that this is one part of my story. I need to go and do more cycles. I know that depression and anxiety are not no longer scary. I know they're now messengers. I know what to do. Um, so the narrative had shifted from I uh, and my life's falling apart too. I have a reason why it was falling apart and I can rebuild it. And it wasn't rebuilt in 63 days, but they have now the ability, the resilience to start the process of rebuilding. They'd got back to work. They were sleeping at 35% improvement in sleeping. I mean, just 10% improvement in sleeping and you're going to feel like a different human. Mm -hmm. And six months later, we tested them again and it was even better. So the point here is that with a very, we didn't, I didn't address, there was no medication. There was no exercise plan or diet plan. Not that I'm anti-diet and exercise, those are very important. I write books about that. But in this particular study, I wanted to focus on first cause, which was helping this person to understand why they were in that state and how they could actually have the autonomy and the agency to shift that process. So that's kind of a, and that story is in the book. And what about your story? Because I love stories. What, what led you, or when have you most needed to work on your own mindset? Could you share some of your story with us? Yeah, um, I've, I've got a podcast called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. And if people want to know lots about my story, I often pop in like in-depth little things that anecdotes that happen in my own life. So 
very early on in my research, I saw that, hey, this is not just for my patients, this is for me. I used to wake up complaining every day. I used to wake up seeing the negative and wondering why my day was so challenging and why I was so exhausted at the end of the day. So I started practicing using the system on myself first. Um, so that was one of the things. And I found that that shifted my whole day and my whole sleep pattern. So very early on. Also, I have, um, like anyone, we've all had our challenges in life. I mean, my husband was an alcoholic for 11 years and we've been married 35. And dealing with that and having four babies and trying to do research and PhDs, there, there was a lot of, of, of challenges in my life and many times when we nearly got divorced, but we pushed through. And if I didn't have a system of recognizing this is I'm feeling this because of these reasons and this is what I'm going to do and this is my action plan and being able to actually talk it through, I would have fallen apart. So the key thing that really facilitated the process and I didn't actually go for therapy but because I had so many friends that were therapists and I would talk this through and I was training people all the time. So I was always using my own story in I was lecturing, training physicians, training therapists. So my whole, I think all the time I was giving myself therapy and talking to these people and you and the feedback. So in other words, the constant, I didn't push it down. For my story has been one of as something and um, as I um, go through anything in a day, as something hits me, I know what my I know how to recognize and read my patterns. So as soon as there's any kind of it, it, emotional pattern that throws me, and I see it's consistent, I know that I need to do a 63 day cycle. That there's something that if there's a pattern, it means that I have. No, I've got something that I haven't dealt with and I will start working through. I'm always working through a 63 day cycle because there's always traumas from the past that come up, they're triggered. There's trauma, new traumas that we experience. And I mean, that's just life. We should be trauma informed as I'm sure you agree. Um, in terms of, of um, just how I apply the neurocycle in terms of my daily existence, the challenges of running a business and and uh, four kids that are adults and doing research, like anyone, I'm busy and things happen. Someone will put a terrible comment on an Instagram post, or I'll get an email that throws you, or there's a trauma in the family. Um, I honestly use the, uh, I've got my, my mind to a point where I don't allow myself to get depressed. I allow myself that anxiety. I give myself permission because I don't see it as an illness. I see it as it's okay to be a mess. Mm -hmm. And then I work in repairing it and growing. And it's that permission. I'm kind to myself. I allow myself. I get it out. Sometimes I'll lose my temper and get mad and irritated about the most dumb things. I don't get guilt about that. I say, okay, gosh, that was wrong. I use the guilt in a good way. Hey, that that hurt someone. You know, catch and I catch it quickly. So I'm eighty percent more efficient in seeing the mess, catching the mess, repairing it, and growing. And that's that's how I manage my stories: is being very authentic, honest, open, and not trying to be perfect. It's yeah. recognizing the perfection in me is going to drive the messiness. So I'm I'm very good at owning the mess and cleaning the mess. I don't stay in the mess. That is one thing. I I don't I allow the mess to be expressed. I'll get the irritation out, but because I'm so self-regulated, I'll pick it up quickly. So I'll see, hey, that was really a nasty comment that I just said to my husband, or that that was not a necessary way of thinking about someone who sent me an email or something, because that's not good for my brain and body. It's it's going to give me brain damage. It's it's short. It's it's affecting my telomeres and the million cells I'm making every second. So I'm aware of that and I use that, and I give myself permission and I fix it and I repair and I grow. I love that. You, what you're saying is I allow myself to be a flawed person, having flawed relationships with flawed people, because when you try to be perfect, I mean, people often think that therapists and doctors and scientists are perfect. All child psychologists have perfect children, all marriage counselors have perfect marriages. Yeah. Dietitians have perfect diets. They don't because they're human. And I love the fact that you say, I let myself, I let myself fail. I let myself mess up because I'm human. Exactly. And it's so refreshing because most people are so busy trying to be perfect, which is not possible. No. Just being a flawed human, that's the best all of us can ever be. Like, exactly. I always talk about that is that's why I call this cleaning up a mental mess because we're all a mess because we're human because life is messy and it's like any scientist a scientist is ne their story is never written the so story of science is never written the story of humanity is never written my story is not written and I'm and I'm and I'm better now than I was yesterday because the failures of yesterday weren't failures I know what not to do and that's my attitude and so therefore I let my messy mind work with my wise mind and that's what I teach people because that is what the brain is designed to do the brain is 
when we talk about being wired for love and wired for optimism, it is it is the mess that we're drawn to to fix and repair and grow. So it's the process of as you experiment, you make you you make the wrong choices, you say the wrong things, you do the wrong things, but that's all good and normal as long as you recognize it and clean it up and manage it. So I'm all about messing and managing the mess, not staying in the mess. And if you you will stay in the mess if you aim for perfection. Yeah, because absolutely. yeah, so that's kind of what yeah, that's it's very freeing. It's very hopeful. So I know you're on a time constraint, but I want to ask you one more question. If you could, if you had three top tips for mastering your mind and your mental health and your physical health, could you just share with me your three top tips for mastering your mind? Absolutely. Very, yeah, I can do it very quickly. The top one is understanding the mind brain connection. It's the agency that my mind is actually my first cause, it's the power. So, my computer runs out, I plug it in. It, and then that, and then the computer works because of the power. That's what your mind is. Your mind is is driving the brain. So recognizing that the brain doesn't control me, I control the brain, and I can change my brain. That is so vital. Then to understand that um, that you you can't change what's happened to you. You're not going to find out why that's happened to you either. We spend so much energy thinking, why did people do that? Why did someone rape someone? Why did that happen to me? We've got to let the past and move on from the past. We have to, re that keeps us um, controlled by the past. We have to recognize it's happened. It's bad. There's nothing you can learn from a rape. What you have to do, for example, what you have to do though, is you have to change how you want that to play out into your future. You have to change your story and you have the power to do that. And so that's change. You can't change what's happened, but you can change what. And then it was kind of related to that is also that the fact that we can self-regulate, that we that if you develop your skill of self-regulation, it's a skill that you can develop. The more you practice it, the more self-regulated you become. I've shown in my research that you can you can become such a, you can improve your self-regulation skills by a factor of eighty one percent by working at it daily. A ten percent improvement in self-regulation which is observing your thinking feeling and choosing all day long while you're awake and neuroscience shows we can do this every 10 seconds so if you can learn to be so self-regulated you can change your life and i've shown in my research that you can do this by an 81 percent factor you can improve your self-regulation skills by an 81 percent factor by train through training which is what i teach in, in in my work in the neurocycle and the systems that i've developed so that for is key for people to recognize that you have that kind of kind of power what does that look like that means that in any one day if if i um if, if i if i woke up complaining for example it used to affect my whole day but i catch that i'm so efficient now i'm 80 percent more efficient at catching it so there's only a 10 20 percent chance of me staying in a complaining state and even then i'm going to catch it if, if because it'll last maybe for an hour in the past it would last the whole day and it would affect everything um, now I catch it as I wake up. That's that's the point I'm making. Or if I'm if I get irritated or worked up or respond incorrectly, I mean me within within seconds I'm identifying and fixing. Whereas in the past it may have gone on for a few hours and messed up the next few hours of the day. So that's that's the difference, the shift. It's the permission that you give yourself that hey I can feel depression, I can feel anxiety. These are not bad things. These are beautiful messengers that are telling me something. Let me see them for what they are and track the, track them back to the source. Those really keep me. Those are really three things that can really help people. Thank you. It's been amazing. I love that. I love that, you know, it's all about the narrative you have with yourself and the narrative you have with yourself can make your life a masterpiece or not. Depending on Absolutely. Like, sometimes all you have is the narrative, but if you, exactly. you know, you're on a plane, it gets delayed, doesn't take off, gets rerouted, things go wrong. But if you have a narrative, and my husband gets lost, I always say, well, it's an adventure. I try not to say, oh, God, this is a nightmare. I say, it's an adventure. We're going to go a different I way. love that. Yeah. I, I, and I don't always do it, but I mostly try to say, this is an adventure. This is fun. This is a challenge. I, but the thing that helps me a lot is to think, my life and yours too, our problems are someone else's fantasy dream come true. Someone else would love to have four kids that leave peanut butter smears all over the counter, a husband, yeah. <laughs> a car that, you know, you're in the freeway going to a really important event. So there's someone in the world that would take your problem to my go, oh, I'd love that problem. I'd, I'd love that problem. You're... Problem is my idea of a fantasy. You've got heart, your baby's keeping you up at night. Your kid can't do math. Uh, it's 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 a great thing to have problems. It means you've got a good life. So I love everything. I love that. 
Mm, I love what you just said too. That's a beautiful way. Of, that's yeah. really that's reconceptualization to a yeah. T. And that's what our that's what our mind brain connection is the best at. When we do what you've just described, you yeah. put your mind brain connection into the psychoneurobiology into the most healthy state. Just one last thing: where can we find you? Because I'm sure we'd love to listen to your podcast, and you're so compelling. I'd like to hear more. So where can our audience find you and get more of you? Because we definitely Thank you. need more of you. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, my podcast is called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. The same title as my latest book, so that's easy to remember. And my uh, Instagram, all my social media handles, Dr. Caroline Leaf. So from, from Instagram, you can get everywhere. And my webpage, drleaf.com. And um, yeah, I think, and, and my app is called Neurocycle. Same name as the system I developed in the book uh, that's written in the book. And that's available on iTunes and Google Play. Check out my next video here. When you do one loving thing for your body, it will do so many loving things back. It's not just that you can walk better, you feel better, you jump out of bed better, you probably have better sex. What I think is the main thing that I love about it is that I, I'm proud of myself for having done this.